So tonight we have all of our eight candidates here that are running for the legislative seat for the first Franklin district. So how about applause for the fact that all eight of them are here It's a rare time when a legislator steps down as opposed to retiring or, um, or uh, being forced out of office for one reason or another, which might happen before too long. <laughs> um, but we're really, we're really pleased to have all these folks here, uh, all eight people who have decided to put their names forward, put their energy forward, and um, say what they believe and what they're willing to work for for our district. And that's a really important thing. Um, Steve Kulik has done a great job for us. He was in the, in the um, State House for 25 years. And um, now we're looking for new people. I counted up last night, we have equal number of men and women running, so that's really nice, four men, four women. And um, this is going to be the year of the women running legislatively. There's more than 300 people running, women running so far that have declared across the country. So we're very, very excited to have four women running and our four gentlemen as well. Um, and we have two people from Sunderland who are running and every, all the other people are from different parts of the district. So that's also very interesting. Um, so I'm going to tell you how this is going to work. Each of the candidates has already picked their number for um, the rotation of speakers. Everyone is going to have five minutes to speak on the topics of their own choice. I sent them out um, a list of questions that we had developed in the, in the Sunderland Democrats. Um, but what I had, had said to them is that we want to hear what their top priorities are for the district so that we can begin to get a feel for who they are and whether they are going to be leading us in a direction that is the direction we want to go and continue Steve's work and strike out on their own, um, in their own directions as well. So everybody will have five minutes. Um, Scott over here has a, can you show us your sign? <laughs> so Scott, you have to move over here where people can see you. Okay, so people are going to get a one-minute warning, and then they're going to get a 30-second warning. So you get your 30-second warning, that really means wrap up the thought that you're on, and stop. Okay? I did this at the forum for the governor's forum, and there was only one or two times during the forum where I had to like say, that's an all stop. Um, but then we're going to have time at the end for questions, uh, for you folks to put forward the questions that you have on issues that may not have been addressed or you want greater clarification. So when everyone has spoken, and you can choose to stand up here or you can be wandering around with the mic uh, on the floor, if, whichever you prefer. Um, and then we'll, have, we'll set up chairs in the front here at the end so that people can address candidates who you want to hear from. We won't, will not be able to ask a question and have all the candidates respond to it because we don't have that much time. But, um, and just one thought about questions, uh, and I'll, I'll try to facilitate that discussion, um, so I'll say that later. Okay, <laughs> thank you for coming, and number one is... Hello, everybody, and um, thank you to the Sunderland Democrats for hosting us tonight. My name is Kate albright Hanna, and I'm known as the journalist in the race, um, but I've actually spent my life going back and forth between journalism and politics. Um, I prefer the term muckraking journalist because it means somebody who uh, speaks truth to power. Um, my first experience in politics uh, was in college. I was an intern in the White House in 1995, and um, I actually discovered that I didn't like politics very much. Um, it was petty and cynical and mean, and not particularly kind to women. Uh, so I pivoted to journalism to make my big impact on the world. Um, I became a documentary producer at CNN, and when the dominant story was 9-11 and uh, all the news was about war and torture, I uh, directed a piece about securing our civil liberties uh, in a climate of fear, and I won an Emmy for that. 
Um, after Hurricane Katrina, I went down to New Orleans to do a story about people rebuilding their lives after the storm. Um, but I came across evidence that police officers had shot and killed civilians who were trying to um, flee across a bridge uh, from the flood. And, um, you know, I went back to my bosses at CNN, and they weren't very interested in the story, but I pushed, and ultimately those police officers were guilty and they were brought to justice. Um, in 2004, I covered the Howard Dean campaign um, and became interested in a movement of young people who believed that they could disrupt politics with technology and that they could use it to harness people power to defeat the influence of wealthy corporate interests. In 2008, I asked the Obama campaign if I could continue to follow that story and do a documentary about them, and they said no, uh, but you can join us on the inside and document um, the movement that's surrounding our campaign. So I did. I joined the digital team as the director of video, and I produced over 2,000 videos, my team did, um, that documented a historic grassroots movement of people who wanted fundamental change in the way politics worked. Um, but something happened, or didn't happen, after that incredible moment. Um, it turned out that just technology, the internet, wasn't enough. We couldn't click our way to a better world. Um, we had to be rooted in real communities. Um, I had to be rooted in a real community, and that's why my husband and our three children moved to Huntington. Um, here in Western Massachusetts, we found this alternate universe to the corporate dystopia that grips most of the country. Uh, this is the home of Shay's Rebellion. This is where people live their values as abolitionists and activists in the Underground Railroad, and this is where a new vision for a new America will take hold. The road back to our better future starts with the basics. It starts with Beacon Hill keeping its promises. You know, like reimbursing our school transportation costs, like fairly compensating our towns with payments in lieu of taxes, pilot, for state lands, like updating the education funding formula so that it actually reflects the true cost of public education. The Foundation Budget Review Commission found that the current school funding system underestimates the cost of educating our students by one to two billion dollars a year. In Boston right now, they're finally putting our schools and our towns against each other. All of us operating at a bare bones level and fighting for scraps, while they shrug their shoulders and lecture us about efficiency and waste. Meanwhile, our family farmers are just barely hanging on to a livelihood that makes us all stronger and more resilient. Our small business community is doing everything it can to keep our wealth local and to make sure our businesses serve our communities and not large corporations somewhere across the world. And our families are facing a, a lack of job opportunities that can easily lead to addiction and despair. We have to stop the bleeding immediately by covering the basics. And then, step by step, we start to dream, we start to plot, we scheme, and we build. This fall, Western Massachusetts is going to send a whole new delegation to Beacon Hill, and we have an opportunity to arrive as a united front. Together, we can fight for single-payer health care, for fully funded, robust public education, for debt-free college, thriving family farms and a strong local economy. Together, we can make sure that we get our fair share of the $2 billion the state expects to raise if we pass the Fair Share Amendment, also known as the Millionaire's Tax on the ballot this fall. If you send me to Boston, I will harness our collective power in Western Massachusetts, our talent, our undervalued natural resources, and our stubborn resilience and ingenuity, and I will amplify our voices and make them listen. That's the secret power of a muckraking journalist, and I hope you give me the opportunity to wield it on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, some of the Democrats, and, and uh, good evening to all of you Democrats and unenrolled and, and uh, everybody who's here tonight. My name is Andrew Baker, and I'm one of the eight candidates for state representative in the 1st Franklin District. And uh, I'm running to continue the work that I've been doing uh, over the past 25 years in the 1st Franklin District to strengthen our communities. We've been, I've been working uh, with uh, almost, uh, almost 15 of the 19 communities in a variety of capacities. And I, I think to have strong and vital communities, we need to work to honor and care for our elders. We need to support both uh, excellent and affordable public schools. And we need to strengthen our businesses and create good jobs that will attract and keep young families in our uh, towns. As you all know, 
Our populations out here have been flat or declining over the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, and our population is getting grayer. Um, we, will, we will, in Shelburne, where I come from, uh, we will have 40% of the population will be over 65 in 10 years. So that gives you a picture of uh, who we are and who we need to work with. Um, but those words that I've just given you uh, are nice sounding words that um, go well on a, on a news release and, or a Facebook page. Uh, but as some of the people who have been signing my nomination papers have asked me, so what about those words? And I think the reason that I have uh, decided to enter the campaign is that I want to offer you the opportunity to elect a representative who can put real substance behind those words and has the experience in community development projects in your communities uh, to back that up. So I've been working, when I moved up to this region almost 30 years ago to work on affordable housing projects. Uh, I, worked, I work where I live in Shelburne and, and the western uh, Franklin County hill towns, uh, running the Shelburne Falls Area Business Association for seven years. Uh, I spent four years running the Hilltown Community Development Corporation, doing housing and elder services, small business support in the Hampshire Hilltowns. And I currently work for the Franklin Hampshire Regional Employment Board. And uh, I work with GCC and uh, on workforce training projects uh, that serve uh, the, the project that we're, we've been working on for the last four years is to train adults who are reskilling for new careers um, to become precision machinists. So we work up in the Franklin County Tech School in their new machine shop. And uh, over the last four years, we have helped graduate almost 150 uh, new uh, machinist trainees who are getting uh, a start down the pathway to become, uh, to get good, skilled, middle-class jobs. Uh, it takes about five years to build a good skilled machinist um, and we give them that start through this training. I'm proud to say that uh, my work is helping people get those jobs and engaging those businesses. Um, so that's something I have practical experience in. We have an 84% job placement rate. Um, so that's, that's something that we can continue to replicate uh, in these communities. In addition to uh, community development work, I also serve on the Shelburne Select Board and have spent uh, six years before that serving on the school committee for the Mohawk District. So uh, public education is near and dear to my heart and figuring out how we can both afford to pay for it as towns um, and continue to build uh, the excellence that uh, that is in those schools uh, is something that I'm strongly committed to. I'm proud that uh, our principal at the Mohawk District is here tonight. Uh, so I've, I'm, uh, I'm on the spot. Um, but uh, so that's, that's the kind of, I, I believe that, uh, that if we're going to make an impact uh, for the first Franklin District, we have to look both at both halves of this job. Half of it is in Boston representing your values and your interests with the Western Mass Delegation, the Rural Schools Coalition, etc. The other half is right here in the district working with you on just the kinds of projects I've spoken about. So I'd be happy to continue doing that. So I'm Natalie Blay. I'm from Sunderland and I'm an interstate representative. I'm hoping to fill the very large shoes of Steve and I want to thank the Sunderland Democrats for having us here tonight and for bringing us all together. A lot of people have asked me over the last few months, why are you doing this? And let me tell you, it's not because of the six month long job interview leading up to the election. I thought long and hard about whether or not I wanted to run for this position, whether or not I could effectively represent these 19 communities with everything I had in the way that they deserve to be represented. I'm running because I believe I have the experience necessary to represent the people of the 1st Franklin District at a time when we are experiencing a power vacuum on Beacon Hill. We need someone who can hit the ground running, with the experience to make a difference as soon as they are elected. 
I'm running because I worked for Congressman John Wilburn and Congressman Jim McGovern for 10 years, and I place a premium on constituent services. I want to be as responsive, accessible, and available as Steve Kulik was. I'm running because I saw the power that building zero net energy, affordable housing, as we did at Wisdom Way in Greenfield, can have on a family's future. We cannot saddle residents who are already struggling with additional debt. I want to be your state representative to fight for clean energy investments that benefit everyone in our community and fight global climate change. I'm running because I have seen what happens when transportation investment stops in Boston. I want to be your voice on Beacon Hill fighting for Chapter 90 funds, the Small Bridge Repair Program, and the public transportation dollars that we need to support our regional transportation authorities and expand rail service. I'm running to ensure that our local schools are not only funded properly, but that we are focused on teaching our students how to be good citizens who are involved in our democracy. I want to support our children in Boston by fighting for scarcity aid and fixing our broken Chapter 70 funding system. I'm running because I was there at MassDOT on I-91 when we broke ground on the fiber optic cable network to bring middle mile connections to Western Massachusetts. I want to be the state representative that follows through on that promise to bring last mile connections to every single town in Western Massachusetts. But not only that, Let's look beyond those connections and figure out together how we can succeed with broadband. Imagine that. <laughs> how are we harnessing this technology to encourage economic development? How are we using it to stop young people from leaving our region? And how are we retaining talent? I'm running because I believe that we need to end hunger. I have walked a marathon annually, literally, with Congressman Jim McGovern, Andrew Morehouse from the Western Mass Food Bank, and Monty Belmonte for years to draw attention to the fact that families in our region are struggling with hunger. Nearly 50,000 people seek food assistance in Franklin and Hampshire counties. I want to be your state representative who fights to end hunger and support programs like the Healthy Incentive Program and SNAP. I'm running because I walked alongside Chip and Sandy Williams through their fields that have been reduced to sand in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. I want to be the person on Beacon Hill that helps our communities when they face disaster. I want to support programs like the Community Preservation Act that have funded projects like in our library in the Riverside Park. And I want to support farmers like Mr. Williams and the Wisman family at Mike's Maze because I want to support their efforts to diversify and succeed. I'm running for the seat because I believe now, more than ever, we need someone with character, integrity, and conviction who can work on behalf of all 19 communities in the 1st Franklin District every single day on Beacon Hill. I believe that person is me, and I respectfully ask for your vote on September 4th. Thank you, with that Sunderland Dance, for having us here today. Um, I'm Francis Wisniewski, I'm running for a state representative, I'm, I'm excited to do that, and of course this is always, you know, our first forum is very nerve-wracking, but, you know, the reality is like, I'm eager to do this job. I have been in the, uh, with the boots in the ground since Stephen announced he was retiring, and I, I'm seeking an opportunity to be elected. Um, I moved from South America in my early 20s um, to come back and pursue uh, my master's degree in education. I grew up uh, with two hardworking parents who ensure that we understand that our neighbors and education was the key of success for every single person. So I know the speech that I have best for you will be in my car going back home, so I really forgot about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the past 30 years or so in the United States, we have seen an economy that has left the working families behind. You cannot no longer be a working person and support a family on what you make or we make. You cannot afford healthcare or to buy a house and maintain a mortgage. And if you can afford them, you are living paycheck by paycheck. I know that for a fact. And we need to make an economy and have a system that brings us back and moves us forward, which, um, and we need to make an economy that, have, that will support families. And this is why I'm focusing on amplifying efforts for education 
economic development, healthcare, and well-being. It is my commitment to continue sustaining and improving the systems to better serve our community in the Commonwealth. Franklin first is a unique district and an unique candidate, and the first Latina to run ever for this post. I was raised by two hardworking parents who taught me that community and education are the keys that open the pathways to success. My parents were very hard to us in elementary education, which was not free um, in a city with three million people. We really have to. Um, we really have hard times trying to meet ends with education and put in foot and table. I believe in people and in fair, transparent, and open government. We can and must do more for families and equality. Starting with affordable and accessible childcare, which is no longer optional, the state government must win this fight. No one should have to choose between caring for the families and loving ones and earn a paycheck. Universal, accessible childcare and paid family and medical leave can give working families the financial stability and peace of the mind they need. I know that strong families build strong communities and will fight to keep Massachusetts, and I will fight to keep Massachusetts families thriving. Our local Western community has proven to be an economic engine that is leading in Massachusetts. While the Commonwealth economy is improving in many sectors, too many families have felt shut out and left behind. We must reveal ladders of economy, opportunity, and ensure that everybody gets a fair, a fair shape. Paying for homes should break the, break the bank. I probably can, many of you will empathize with it, but this right now. Families shouldn't have to choose between going rock or moving out of the communities they were raised and cared for. With the cost of living continuing to soar across the Commonwealth, we need to adopt bold statewide policies that promote inclusive, affordable housing. These issues particularly affect low-income individuals, immigrants, women, and children. When we care for disadvantaged members in our community, we all win. Working families depend on every community member to succeed both at home and at the workplace. We all benefit when individuals receive equal pay, access to quality health care, paid family leave, and most importantly, fair representation at the table of the policy making. Every citizen in the Commonwealth deserves the same opportunities and securities, just like every child deserves um, a rich for high quality education and care. Public schools, community colleges, and universities are the foundation of our communities. We deserve safe, accessible public transportation. With public transit, tra transit ridership racing and more cash on the road than ever, we need to invest in multiple modes of transportation. As good legislator, I will prioritize efforts to improve safety and accessibility for drivers, bus riders, pedestrians, and cyclists. Government should belong to the people and the citizens of Massachusetts. So we vote for the government that is going to work on our behalf, and it's imperative that accessible and responsible to our voters in here. So on Monday, I'm running the Boston Marathon, and I have a hard work ethic and discipline. I'm committed, and I'm ready to represent this district. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Waring. Uh, I'm an un unapologetic uh, progressive. A little nervous about that. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Susan and the Southern Democrats for having us here, uh, and Barb and the rest of the uh, deacons of the church for uh, letting us use this room. Uh, if only we ever had the problem we have tonight, which is we have too many people who want to be involved. So thank you all for showing up. This really uh, you know, makes you very happy to know that this many people in our little community um, are involved and are. You know, motivated this season. Oh, <clears throat> uh, in recent years, the, the extreme elements of the GOP have managed to shift the political spectrum of the United States very far to the right. By bringing fringe elements of the right into the mainstream and normalizing Fox News, Alex Jones, Breitbart, and the alt right, these extremists have made more moderate Republicans look like centrists and liberals look like extremists. And to those of us who populate the other end of the political spectrum, we must push back, and that's why we're here today. As state representative, I will help to shape the progressive agenda of the Massachusetts House, which in turn will help shape the, projected, shape the agenda of the nation as a whole. Because while my primary concern will always be to fight for the people of our district within the Massachusetts legislature, we also need to work on the state level to combat the destructive forces that is taking over our nation. 
In 2016 in Massachusetts, in order to afford a rent on a two-bedroom apartment, a full-time worker needs to make $25.91 an hour. Just wanted to think about that for a second. That's just to afford a two-bedroom apartment, one worker, $25 an hour. Which means that even at $15 minimum wage, which is what we we're trying to fight for this year, that falls far short of being able to provide for one's family and being able to support oneself. Um, I would like to push the Democrats to move towards a $20 minimum wage. Uh, I think more than anything else, this is not enough money at $15 an hour. I think that we need to move beyond that. Um, more than that, if we put fight for 15 or fight for 25, or sorry, if we fight for 20, we might get 15, which is what we're hoping for. A little background of who I am. Uh, for the last seven years, I have worked as a cable guy, um, as a contractor for Comcast. Um, a bunch of you out there are probably looking at me saying, I can feel that guy from somewhere. I have no idea. <laughs> and it's because I'm climbing telephone poles outside your house and you're calling me your garage. You know who you are. Um, in that time, I had the lovely opportunity of getting a chance to meet and talk to most of the, of the um, towns in this district. Um, unfortunately, Comcast does not reach out as far as uh, many of us would like them to. Uh, that's one of the big platforms I'm running on is expanding the programs like GCET and LeverettNet, uh, using that, that framework that they've developed to expand broadband access further into the towns, um, further to the east and the west. Um, I grew up in Shrewsbury, I am here in Sutherland, and so I have a perspective of having both lived in one of these hill towns that under I understand what it's like to, to get home and realize you forgot to move, and it's going to be a 25 minute ride back down to town to get some. Um, but I also understand what it's like to live in a area with farmers um, that have, that have uh, different perspectives between those two. I also am here on a workers' rights platform. Uh, as a, contract, con a contractor for Comcast, one of the things I noticed very quickly on is that workers are only protected as far as the law absolutely literally requires. Uh, in that time, I worked for a number of companies who have been sold from one to another, and uh, I had companies who refused to pay us sick time. I had companies who refused to reimburse us for expenses. Uh, I paid my own gas. I drove around to your houses for years paying my own gas. Um, and it culminated in a, a company laying us all off two years ago, uh, at which point we were told we would not be receiving any of our uh, accrued vacation or sick time. Um, which is very much illegal in Massachusetts, which I brought to their attention. Uh, and long story short, because I have 30 seconds left, uh, I have been fighting for the last five years for workers in this area, and I will plan on continuing that and that. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Casey Pease, and I just want to thank the uh, Sutherland Democrat Town Committee for having us here. Um, you know, I'm coming with the perspective running this for this office, being somebody who grew up and was born and raised in this district. Um, and with that has given me the understanding of the issues here, uh, but also the rewards of living here. Um, early on, I was really inspired actually by my grandmother, uh, Julia Sharon. She was the first woman who was ever elected to the Worthington Select Board in its 250 years. And actually she, she served 11 years uh, with Steve Kulik, who also had a profound influence on me wanting to be involved. Uh, one of my first big uh, steps in politics and organizing was actually working as a Massachusetts director for the campaign for a presidential youth council. And so I was tasked with reaching out to all of our members of Congress in Massachusetts and trying to get them to sign on to legislation uh, that would establish a youth council that would advise the president of the United States. So I said, okay, I have to figure out how I can get them to sign on board with this legislation. So I was reaching out to the Congress members, to their staff, and I decided to write a resolution that I had Steve Kulik uh, and then Senator Ben Downing sponsor in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Uh, and that was passed unanimously. And a copy was sent to every member of Congress and the President of the United States at the time, then Barack Obama. And being a young person, getting involved, <laughs> and have this opportunity to, to pass this resolution was a huge motivation to me and to my peers. Um, from there, I started a number of organizations um, at my at Gateway Regional High School, Mali United Nations Club, uh, a youth service uh, organization. And then when I started studying political science at UMass Amherst, 
I had the opportunity of working as one of the youngest staffers on the Bernie Sanders campaign for president. Um, and that was such a unique and exciting experience because I was able to organize in states across the country, uh, mainly rural areas and college campuses. And that gave me a really good perspective on what people uh, in rural areas and what uh, college students were concerned about and the issues that were affecting them. Uh, from there, I had the opportunity to manage a state senate campaign um, in the 52-town senate district that uh, borders Senator Rosenberg's and encompasses most of the 1st Franklin district. And what was great about that experience is I was knocking on a lot of your doors and asking you what issues do you want to see advocated for on the state level? What issues matter most to you? And so for the past six years, I've worked in a number of different advocate, uh, advocacy organizations uh, and for political candidates. And I believe that we have a very unique opportunity to elect somebody who is energetic and is bold and has a progressive vision for our district. That means supporting a single payer healthcare system, a Medicare for all system in the Commonwealth and working with our neighboring states uh, potentially to create a, a regional program. That means advocating for public education. We have to reform the Chapter 70 funding formula, which was written in 1993 uh, and is archaic to our modern times. And that means addressing rural sparsity aid. That means addressing regional transportation costs. And being a student at UMass Amherst, we also have to figure out how can we make college more affordable for our young people? Because it is unacceptable that we have an entire generation of folks who are starting their careers in crippling debt, right? That means supporting free community college. That means supporting uh, debt-free college. And one issue that's incredibly important to me as well, being a young person, is access to broadband internet. I've served on the Worthington Broadband Committee advocating for this issue, and I've spoken to a number of young people, people I went to school with, who have left the region, or they don't want to move to this region because they don't have that access. So that is a huge concern and we have to be able to work with the 19 communities in the 1st Franklin District to finish the last mile. Um, we also have to expand the regional economy and that means working with our farmers and, and um, agriculture. And I have 30 seconds left so I just I want to say all the issues that we're going to be talking about through the campaign are so important. But I am bringing the perspective of a young person who's lived here, who is a volunteer firefighter, and has experience both advocating in the streets and working with policymakers in the chambers. And so I respectfully ask for your vote on Tuesday, September 4th, and you can find out more about my platform by visiting kcps.org. How is everybody doing tonight? I question your judgment. It is the nicest night that we have seen this spring, and you are inside a congregational church in Central Massachusetts. How dare you? My name is Jonathan Edwards. I first want to thank the Central Democrats for hosting us tonight and giving all eight of us the opportunity to speak here tonight and ask for your support and your vote on September 4th. You should be excited as Democrats because there are eight tremendous candidates running for this seat. I would like to think I am one of them, but there are eight phenomenal people running for this seat who are gonna give it their all through September to ask for your support and that of people from 18 other towns across this district. And every one of them has my admiration. But my name is Jonathan Edwards and I am running and I am asking you for your support. I'm a 14-year member of the Waitley Select Board. In that time, I've also served for five of the past six years as the president of the Franklin County Select Board Association. It means that I believe in regional collaboration. It means that I understand that for any of the towns in this district to succeed, they need to work with the other towns, with their neighboring towns, fostering great ideas and leveraging those ideas that are born from other towns and communication with those other towns. I am very proud of the fact that I was a leader, along with my friends from Deerfield and Sunderland, in the formation of the South County Emergency Management Service. 
A 24 hour, seven day a week paramedic level service is not possible in a town the size of any of ours if we go it alone. Only working together, only sitting at the table and finding commonalities with people who might have differences with you. Can you succeed in achieving something as great as SCAMS is? And through that partnership and through working diligently to overhaul this, the, the South County Senior Center, again with friends from Sunderland and Deerfield, were we able to further the, 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 the causes of seniors in this region. So I know how to succeed in this region because it is working with everybody. And I, and I have strong relationships with so many of the people who represent you today. And I'm honored to be endorsed by the three select board members from Sunderland and one of your school committee members because they've seen me work, they've worked with me, and they understand the value of that regional collaboration. I got my democratic roots working for Evelyn Murphy. Yes, that dates me. But I got my democratic roots working for Evelyn Murphy when she, when she was lieutenant governor. I was on John Oliver's first congressional cam campaign after Sil Conti died. My formative days in the Democratic Party were spending five years with former Senator Paul Saunders, first on his presidential campaign and then working for him in a nonprofit organization. Paul taught me the true values of being a Democrat. Paul taught me the true values of working with people and making sure that you have your convictions and you always understand where other people are coming from. Because of my experiences in overhauling a senior center, in forming an emergency management service, I have that government experience. I know the people who are going to be representing, hopefully with me, in Massachusetts, such as Smitty Pignatelli, working with uh, Representative Gonzalez in Springfield. I, I've worked with all these people on a regular basis, and I hope to continue to do that because only together can we find greatness. And by the way, greatness is truly our destiny. So I'm gonna sum, sum up with a couple of quick professional successes. I have fought climate change for over a decade in this, in this region. Forming jobs, supporting clean tech, making sure the energy efficiency is not an abnormal thing, but it's the norm. Climate change is generationally a disaster. It is, it is a generational immorality that we need to fight. But the beauty is, it's also the greatest jobs creator we have in this region. Yes. It is a twofer that no one should forget we need to fight every day for. And it is why when I'm in the State House, I will work to be on the Technology Committee, the Joint Committee on Technology and Innovation, and I will make sure that I'm on, on, I'm on the Energy Committee and Climate Committee, because it's that important. I also spend my time sitting on making sure that people on the economic sidelines at Springfield are off the economic sidelines with workforce training. I could go on, I can't. <laughs> but I encourage you to go to edwardsforwesternma.com and please, please, please learn about me and support my campaign. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming tonight and thank you Sunderland Democrats for hosting us. I'm Christine Dother. I'm from Cummington, Massachusetts. I was originally from Peru, Massachusetts, which neighbors our district to the west. And I absolutely love growing up in the woods with a Yankee work ethic. And my sister really thrived at Peru's one-room schoolhouse, where each row of desks was its very own grade. And um, my mom's from Queens, but she went to Springfield College. And she met my dad, who was from Amherst, and going to UMass. And even though we lived out in the middle of nowhere, my dad was able to have a great job as an engineer at GE. But um, life for us got more complicated once the district closed out Peru's one-room schoolhouse and my parents divorced. I was nine at the time, and my mom and I found ourselves in a position where we had to move three times in six years searching for affordable housing. Uh, but we managed. And my sister and I were able to pursue our dreams. My sister is now an opera singer, and I went to Columbia Law School, where I graduated with honors, and then became a trial attorney, and split my practice between litigation and public interest legal work. And then, um, when, when my partner, Frank Philbrook, and I were expecting our first child, we had an amazing opportunity to take over his family farm in Cummington. And we had, for a while, thought about being closer to our parents 
and, um, and Frank's grandparents at the time. So we decided to move back home and reestablish some of our childhood connections with our friends, with the community, with the land, um, you know, and also it was such a gift to have all that childcare <laughs> when we came back. I don't know how we would have done it otherwise without all the grandparents and great grandparents. So when we got back, we were really happy to be back on the farm, uh, but the memories of our pastoral childhood were replaced with a mixed reality of highs and lows. We had new neighbors by the farm next to us, and they started a cheese-making operation, and we started co-farming with them, which was really wonderful. But on the other side, uh, in the other direction, one of our neighbors and a lifelong acquaintance, who's also a farmer, was suffering with an opioid addiction. And that was, that was really hard. And our beloved general store was in the process of becoming a beloved community-owned cooperative, and I now serve on the board of that cooperative. Um, but a neighbor's herd of dairy cows was sold off to a Canadian firm. And we wrestled with the fact that there was GMO corn being grown on our land and had been there for 30 years. And this was exposing the land and us and our neighbors to atrazine and glyphosate. Um, and without those chemicals, it was not financially viable to continue growing the corn. So soon after we settled into our 150-year-old farmhouse, um, we started getting a lot of knocks on the door. People heard I was attorney, and they came to me with legal questions. Everything from veterans benefits, to teacher association questions, to I want to start a 501c3, can you help me with the filing, um, to child custody issues, and divorced moms and kids coming to me for some help. So in response, I created two pro bono legal services organizations to, to fill the need in the hill towns. Um, and then, and then another happy thing is uh, our son was born right on our farm. Um, but then when my daughter, when my daughter was about to start preschool, the district shut down Covington's elementary school. And when a school closes in a town, or when a school is really struggling financially, it has, it has a huge impact on the town, uh, both to the community and to the finances. Businesses suffer. Young families are harder to attract to the town. Property values decline, our tax revenue drops, and kids who are growing up in the same town are going to whatever school they can choice into, and they don't know each other. So working to preserve our main streets and enhance our small towns and our hill towns means keeping our public schools in our towns and making them great schools. It means attracting young families and fostering their well-being. It means supporting economic opportunities for good jobs, successful businesses, and clean energy. It means we have to support farmers in the production of food, our food, and the stewardship of land, and help them with the balance between viability and sustainability and supporting a clean environment. It also means we have to support our seniors and help them to age in place and maintain their quality of life. So I'm really excited to be running for the 19 towns of First Franklin, and I'm running because I live the issues that we're facing here, and I want what many people want, a district where our kids and grandkids can get a great education and not be burdened by debt, and where people have the option to stay or return and have a wonderful community. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing about your concerns and hopes for our district.